So when I started programming and uh, you know just got out of college and everything, um, the hotshot technology was COM and we wrote C sharp and we prided ourselves in writing code that other COM components couldn't bring down, right? Uh, anyone here have a sense of what that coding was like? No? Oh good, excellent. That's what it looked like. Now that's actually a pretty well structured piece of code and uh, I, I would like to have a moment's silence for all the people who have actually written code like this uh, to make sure that add ref and release got matched correctly and that you check the HR result all the time. And um, uh, heaven help you if you tried to inject a new piece of code in the middle and it didn't quite mess things up after that, you mess things up after that, yeah? So we can kind of relate to that. Now of course we have like managed code, right? So everything is beautiful, uh, worry about all this reference counting nonsense and, and all of that. And we can write clean, composable, nice looking code like that. <laughs> <laughs> right? So we got null checks. We got exception handling, we got try all kinds of garbage. Why is that? Okay. Why is that? It's because some of the stuff that's being done there is actually kind of useful. It turns out that we kind of want to make sure that when we deal with uh, the external world, things can go wrong and we have to deal with them gracefully. Right? People can give you garbage and you have to deal with it. Right? So that's part of the problem. Um, and so you end up having all of these null checking and casting and all of these crazy, crazy patterns that you land up seeing all over the code. And of course, so all of these things are very valid points. You, you need all of this to make code bulletproof, right? Otherwise, it looks like a really good demo. And then you put it up on uh, a production somewhere and then everything goes blank. So, what about this kind of code? Yeah, I'm written code like this, length, right? So that's actually a lot nicer, right? You can actually talk about refactoring pieces of code, composing it, and it makes life a lot easier. You can actually move pieces around relatively safely, right? But we don't write code like this all the time because I told you earlier, you know, the reality is that nothing, everything is not going to come out in this nice little fashion. You've still got to deal with null checks and retry logic. And these are actually useful constructs, right? So we want to write code like this because it's easier to read and easier to maintain and easier to build up, right? Compose properly. But we also want the safety and all of the infrastructural stuff that's going around the place. Right? So if you're like me, when, when you, know, you start writing COM code, you learn a whole ton of tips and tricks about uh, what are the incantations you need to mumble in order to make sure that this thing is going to stay up when everything else is falling down. That, that's code word experience, really. But, but fundamentally, that's solving a real problem, but at the expense of this. So ideally what we want is to write nice little code, clean code, and still be able to handle all the real world problems, right? So we're not running away from any of that. Turns out that uh, we're pretty good at writing small functions, not so good at gluing them together. So the gluing bit that we found out is the problem, is the thing that makes everything brittle. So we're going to figure out how we can do that. So I'm going to come on a little journey with me. Uh, we're at home now. Actually, that's my mouse. Um, so the first part of the journey is obviously, you know, we get out of our front door and take a walk down the garden path. Everything's familiar, right? We aren't even, we haven't even reached the main road yet. So we're going to talk about a very simple journey. And so nobody should be frightened by anything that you see, right? You're going to see code like this. My favorite language, oops, sorry, C sharp. Three functions. What that does takes a function of type A to a result of type A. Three of those functions, right? Nothing scary. What happens if you try to glue those two together? Let's try and glue F and G together. 
what what can you say about the type of R? So notice F takes in A and returns in A, G takes in A, returns in A. So when you compose F and G, the output A of this can be fed into the input there and effectively you go from A to A. Right? Equational reasoning, very, very simple. Didn't have to know anything about F and G in order to come up with that. And this is, of course, anything that you do in any language you want. So nothing scary. Now, this particular operation turns out <coughs> to be so natively uh, important in F sharp that it has its own little operator, which, of course, is that. You've seen that before. And what this is, it takes away the x argument and effectively says r is a function that is equivalent to f operating on g. That's what the function is. Very simple. Right? Let's take a good look at that greater than greater than symbol for a minute. Um, don't get frightened. A function that takes a to a, another function that takes a to a, when put together, will give you a function that goes from a to a. That's all that that compose operator is doing. It turns out that because f sharp syntactic sugar allows you to put that greater than greater than symbol in the middle. It puts it as an infix operator. Right? So that's all that's happened over there. Anyone lost? Is that the actual time in F sharp? Compose? Almost. It turns out to be a little more general than that. It's A to B to B to C to A to B. Yes. I just picked all of the types to be the same just so that nobody gets scared. Right? So none of this stuff should frighten anyone. <clears throat> so what's the first thing we realize? We have this operator. It operates on two things that have the same shape and it gives you another thing of the same shape, right? That property is called closure. That means when this operator works on two things of a given shape, the result is always a function of the same shape, right? The result is also of the same shape. Now let's take the third function and let's talk about what happens when you put G and H together first and F and G together first. Can anyone work out what the relationship between R1 and R2 are? They are the same. And there's a proof for that. In fact, the proof looks like this. Let's apply these two first and get an intermediate result and then call F on that. And let's apply this on a function and apply that on the intermediate result. And you can actually work it out that both of them work out to exactly the same thing. What that means is that the order in which you do this operation doesn't matter. If you have three or more of these things, you can combine them however you want. So this is an interesting property. We'll call this associativity. Okay, um, again, nothing scary, everything's exactly as you, as you remember. Let's look at this one little function called id, which takes an argument and returns an argument. And anyone who's done any F sharp will know that that auto generalizes to that. Now, what can you tell me about id composed with any of the other functions? Any guesses? <coughs> you get the same function. You get the same function. And the proof for that, again, you can work it out at home, but fundamentally, if you take a value A, pass it to ID, you'll get back A. If you call F on A, you'll get back the result. If you call F on A, you'll get back the result, and ID on that will give you back the same thing. So both are exactly the same. So there's this funky little function that you that you have that can actually compose whichever way you want with any other function and not leave 
uh, any trace of it, it being there, right? So it turns out we've got a set of things. There's an operation which takes two of those things and returns another thing. That operation is closed, it's associative. And we're going to call that ID thing a zero. And that's actually available for this class of things. All right. All of this we've observed just by looking at type signatures. We actually haven't looked at anything about the function itself. The only assumption we've made is that these functions don't have any side effects at this point. So that's the only thing I've asked you to assume. Everything else has just fallen straight out of this picture. Have I lost anyone? Good thing, because we haven't actually caught a flight yet. <laughs> we've just come out down the garden path, taken a cab, and then we've saw, seen some sights along the way. And now uh, you guys need to hang on a little bit. We're going to speed things up a touch. <clears throat> Who can tell me what that is? Has anyone encountered that before? <laughs> Don't use that word, man. It's like 10 minutes. I didn't say. That's just a type. That's a generic type. That's all there is. It's a generic type that makes one type argument. That's all there is to this. You've seen it in C sharp. You've seen it even in Java, although that's slightly weir weirder. But that's all there is. You've seen this in F sharp. Right? It's just a generic type. The only thing that we're going to look at it is we look at it through a different lens here. This is like a function that takes a type as an argument and returns another type. Is that too far-fetched for anyone to follow? It takes a type argument and returns another type. So therefore we're going to call it a type constructor just for the sake of, for, just for looking at only that lens of it. But what we're going to do is we're going to take those functions that we wrote and instead of returning an A, we're going to return some value of the type that's constructed with A. Right? And really, this should be fairly straightforward for anyone to see. There's no, we, haven't done, we haven't done anything funky with it yet. The only thing that we've actually probably done as smart people over here, everyone will notice that I can't compose these things anymore. Right? A broken composition. In fact, I'm going to step one level further and break composition even more. And this is to answer your question, sir. I'm actually going to give them different types. So I'm going to take a type A to B. I'm going to create the type based on B. And then I'm going to take the same type B and create a new type based on C. Right? Now a well and truly broken composition, right? That that's actually the most general version of the compose operator. And this is the stuff that doesn't work. So we've got this function. We know that this works. And we want to have something that makes this happen. So I want to take this function, compose it with that function to get me that. Right? But this piece of magic doesn't exist anymore. Now. Walk with me about what 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 does that func what what would that magic piece look like? That magic piece would take a function that goes from a to m of b, and a function that takes a b to m of c, and give me back a function that goes from a to m of c. Right now, this magical thing doesn't exist at this point. But what we'll do is we'll do a little bit of algebra. We'll move this A out to the front so that we have something that goes from M of B with that function to the result we want. So really this function, if we had, we would go from A to M of C. Right? All we've done is just juggle the parameters around. So instead of taking a function that takes two functions, I can take a function that takes a value and a function and glue things together to get the same result. I haven't done anything funky yet, right? 
Now this thing between the squigglies, I need to take a closer look at that. Because that gives me almost exactly what I want. Right? And I'm going to call that this operator, which is kind of like the compose operator. It's a, it's a grown-up version of the compose operator. It takes a wrapped value and a function that takes the unwrapped value to a wrapped result and gives me the wrapped result. So I'm, all I'm going to do is I'm going to create this thing. Oh, what is the implementation of that? Well, as it turns out, it rather depends on what that type is. Right? But if I had that function, then life becomes very straightforward because I can do things like this. If I had this function, I could take these two functions and create the wrapped V by calling F and then call this function with G to give me my result. And lo and behold, my result is actually what I wanted. So we started out with this thing saying, hey, we want to be able to take these two functions with the wrap types and glue them together. We figured out how to do that. And it hasn't taken us very much exercise to do it. It's actually fairly straightforward to get to this point. Right? The only trick is you don't know what that actually looks like at this point. But you can guess that it's somehow related to that type constructor that you've seen there. Right? So, we've gone on a fairly sharp journey now, right? How many people have I left behind in this? No one! Fantastic! This is what I wanted, right? This is what we've seen. We've seen functions. We've seen straightforward composition. We've seen the properties of that composition. We've seen a type constructor. We've seen a function that takes another function in there and allows you to glue them together. And because you can glue them together, you can now go from a raw value to a wrapped result, which is exactly what you wanted to do in the first place. Right. Now, this is all well and good, but what do we do with this pipe constructor? I've kind of waved my hands and made everything go away, and then everything looks really, really simple. But clearly, there's a nagging feeling in the back of your mind that something looks like chicanery here, right? I've just done some hand waving and everything looks... Yeah, it's not quite. So let's take a look at an example here. We go back to the beginning and introduce side effects. So let's say we have a function f1, f2, and f3. This one may throw. That one may also throw. All of these functions can throw. Now they have a side effect involved. If I try to compose like we normally do, the type checker will let me do it because it doesn't know about the side effects. But when you run this, stuff will go kablooey. And this is why we didn't want to write that naive composition behavior before. We wanted the, the, the ease of use of the, the composition, but we didn't want to be able to, we didn't want all the, the runtime uh, danger. Right? We want to have runtime safety. I mean, I mean, another way of doing this is to actually do that. But fundamentally, the problem is that that leads to code like this. And this stuff should look familiar because this is the cluttering code that we started off by saying we didn't want to write. But in order for us to be safe, this is the kind of code you need to write. Right? So you take x, pass it to f1, get a value, check to see if it's going to throw. If it throws, well, raise the result, otherwise pass it on to the next function and then pass it on to the next function and then return the result. And then you're kind of okay. Now, how is this better than the original code that we wrote? It actually isn't. You've got the same maintenance problem if you've got to inject a new piece of code in the middle. you still got the same kind of clutter, right? But now let's take a look at that type constructor and create a little type. We call that type result, right? And this type has two options. It's either going to give me a successful result or it's going to give me 
a failed result with the first exception that got thrown, right? Which is exactly the result, if you think about it, of this code. The first exception that gets thrown, that's what you get. You, see, you want to capture that and make sure that stuff composes properly now. So let's go back in here, let's do that. And then let's write a function that takes f and returns another function, but not the result of the function itself, but a wrapped result of that function, right? And if you look at the type signatures now, this is starting to look like the kind of stuff we talked about just a few minutes ago with the wrapped type, the M type is now a result, right? And because result is now parameterized by T, you can have a result of int, a result of double and a result of string all in the same piece of code, right? And now let's define bind. What was the signature of bind? It took an unwrapped input, I'm sorry, a wrapped input, and a function that went from an unwrapped input to a wrapped output and gave me a wrapped output. And I'm going to write bind in this fashion. And what is that actually doing? It's basically going to say, if result was a failure, I'm just going to pass it back. If result was success, well then I'm going to call, unpack the input of this thing and pass it on so that I can now compose in this manner and get a safe expression. Now that will not blow up. You can compose as much as you like and any one of those things can throw, but this expression will not throw. It will actually give you back a result or an exception, right? I still haven't used that word. Did you yeah. notice? All right. This pattern is actually very, very powerful. In fact, we use it all over the place in F sharp. So there's a little bit of syntactic sugar that you can put around it. That makes your code so much nicer to read, right? What we're gonna do is, we're gonna follow the, the template for building a computation expression. And when you do that, we're gonna do the same thing here. We have a module, we create the type, we copied our bind operator and we're going to add an extra function that takes a value that is unwrapped into a wrapped type. And once we do that, I can actually, how do I scroll in this thing? Sheesh. Hmm? I'm out of luck? Jeez. Hmm? Zoom out. Zoom out. How do I even do that? I don't think I can. Right. So, I, in fact, that's 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 all that you need to do. That type allows you to specify a couple of override overridden functions, and you can use this value in this fashion. So, you see this attempt over here that creates an instance of this type. And you can actually write a piece of code that looks like this. So for example, you can have one, which is a function that returns one, two, which is a function that returns two, three, which is supposed to return int, but is going to throw. And when we start composing these things together, that line will throw and you will return, there is no three as an exception value of that entire expression. So the entire composition that we talked about is actually encapsulated inside this thing. So this syntactic sugar is called a computation expression and this technique for doing stuff is called monadic composition. And in fact, you'll find that, let me zoom, zoom back in, you'll find that many, many foundational pieces of F sharp and indeed of functional programming itself heavily use this idea to allow you to glue functions that have side effects together 
in a safe manner so that you don't actually blow up and you still can manage whatever side effects you want in the same way. So for example, null checking can be wrapped into the option type which turns out to be the maybe monad, right? There's tasks and async which actually allow you to, to model retry behavior which is again a repetitive pattern that shows up all over the place. You can do logging, you can do safe IO, you can do exception handling. All of these things can be done using this monadic composition type of approach. So if you find yourself writing code in F sharp or indeed any other language, you're out of luck if you do it too, too much in C sharp because it's very difficult to abstract this stuff out to make it useful. But at F sharp, you can definitely look at, at situations where you're just blindly composing functions and if there's a hint at some point that any of those functions will throw, you really want to start capturing and managing your side effects in a safe way. And this is how you do it. All right. Now, um, you've probably done this before, so none of this stuff should really scare you, but I'm happy to take questions. And um, there's a couple of uh, interesting, uh, you know, resources that you can look at. Brian Beckman's talk, heavily influenced the talk that I've just given. Um, but there are quite a few people who actually deal with the material in roughly the same way. Scott Lashin has an entire series on computation expressions and talks about how everything uh, folds together nicely. And um, you can either ping me or, and Jacob Stanley was one of my colleagues who helped me with this. There's actually a bunch of laws that talk about monoids and monads and all of that, but we'll leave that for another day. This is actually where I would like to end this point. So, any questions?